What's up, everybody? Welcome to the View from Jamestown podcast edition. This is episode two of three of our special mini series with Avonik. Um, we have Hendrik, Nadine, and Sanjay from Avonik on the episode. Uh, this is a follow up to our first episode. Obviously, this is the special edition where we're focusing on myths and facts surrounding plasticizers and really surrounding DINP specifically. Um, Obviously, the first episode has a great background and long introduction on Avonik as a company on our three special guests here this morning, talking about the plasticizer market and a little bit of an introdu- introduction on phthalates and, and the background and the chemistry with these plasticizers. So please, if you haven't already, you know, go back and stream episode number one. Uh, if you have streamed episode number one, welcome. Glad you were able to make it to episode number two and really looking forward to this episode. This is one that I've looked forward to doing up for, a, for a long time. I think there's a lot of myths and misconceptions out there, and I'm really excited to here straight from the Avonic team on kind of correcting some of these myths that are out there. Um, So the format of this episode will be a bit different than some of our prior ones. So we have six um, myths or thoughts about plasticizers and and really targeted specifically on DINP as a plasticizer with these myths. Um, So the the way it'll sort of work, I'll obviously throw one of these myths out there. I think it'll also pop up on screen as we're talking about it in some of our post-production. So if you're watching the video version, you'll be able to see the the myth that we're answering right there. Um, But I'm going to throw it up right to the first myth here. So the first fact uh, or myth we're going to kind of debunk and and give some more factual information on is that DINP leaks or leaches or evaporates out of a final product. Um, So I think Hendrik will throw that one to you and let's hear more about that. Yeah, um, let's really start with the chemistry that's all behind of that. Um, It is true that um, the plasticizer is not chemically chemically bound uh, to the PVC polymer matrix. Um, So there's always the possibility that um, the plasticizer or the phthalates um, somehow evaporates uh, from the product, that it migrates through the um, PVC matrix to the surface and that their exposure um, um, might happen. Um, As you might maybe remember from the first episode, uh, the chemical structure of the plasticizer defines all the, the technical and the toxicological properties of the plasticizers. And this also is valid for the movement of the plasticizer through the uh, polymer matrix and into the air. Especially low molecular weight plasticizers like DEHP or BBP uh because of their chemical structure with the shortened uh, chain length they evaporates and migrates more easy than the high molecular weight phthalates like di dinp or dinge um sometimes even by factor of 400 there is time 400 times less movement of high molecular weight phthalates compared to the low molecular weight phthalates so that's just a technical fact on the other side, um, let's talk about what really a risk is. If you might already know, risk is defined by um, uh, the combination of exposure and hazard of a product. Um, so if something is not hazardous, you can be exposed to a lot of this stuff without any risk. The other way around, if something, something is hazardous, there is not a risk if you take care of the exposure. Um, especially with the myth of um, DINP leaking, evaporating from the product into the air, and by this creating a risk to human or to nature, I can say clearly that there is no risk at the end because DINP is neither hazardous nor is is there a relevant exposure because the migration and the evaporation is really, really low and Far times lower than of uh, lower molecular weight phthalates. So, at the end, there is no risk of using DINP in its current application. So, there's no no risk of DINP leaking or leaching out of a product based on the technical technical properties of DINP. No, there is of course the possibility that DINP leaches out of the product, but there is no risk behind happening this because. DIMP is not hazardous, so it is not a toxicological risk um, to be uh, exposed uh, to DIMP in such low doses. And 
there's also um, evaporation um, not to the uh, to, not to the such such a great amount that it could pose a risk because the evaporation is limited um, by the chemical nature of the INP. There is always an equilibrium between um, the INP in the substrate and the INP in the air. And this is a fixed equilibrium that cannot be more the INP uh, above a certain level of saturation. Uh, just because of the, that, that's a, that's a technical or a chemical um, uh, effect, and um, the level of the IMP that you could, in the worst case, reach um, in a in a in a room where you don't have any uh, movement of air, this level of saturation is so low that is no risk at all. So yes, there might be some evaporation as everything is in an equilibrium state um, with the air but this level of uh, DIMP in the air is without any risk. Perfect and a, a great answer to myth number one. Um, Nadine I believe we'll throw it to you for myth number two and that is that DINP accumulates in body and in nature. Uh, yes, uh, and as we see, myths about DIMP are diverse, and in such cases, it's good to talk about it as we do it now, and it's essential to rectify it and also consider scientific mechanisms and biological processes that are relevant. And yeah, first, it should be questioned how we can be exposed to DIMP and under normal use conditions um, of DIMP containing products. Um, exposure is negligible and will be below relevant thresholds, as we heard from Hendrik uh, in his answer before. Um, yeah, but please let me highlight uh, some other aspects and um, concerning the accumulation in nature, it's documented and proven by testing that DIMP is readily biodegradable, um, meaning that breakdown of DIMP by physiological processes will take place in the environment. And in addition, DIMP is not bioaccumulative. So therefore, accumulation in nature is, is not a concern. And for human body accumulation, it's equivalent. And DIMP does not accumulate in human body as well. And all reliable data we have indicate, uh, on the one hand, that exposure is low and the general population is not at risk. And um, yeah, on the other hand, it's well understood how DIMP acts and distributes in organisms and the human body. Um, yeah, because uh, several studies are performed and yeah, the behavior of DIMP within the body is evaluated and studied. So theoretically, DIMP can be taken up um, if exposure occurs. Um, yeah, but um, the data indicate that DAMP is readily metabolized and excreted once it was absorbed. And this is a completely normal process that yeah, takes place with every substance that enters our body. For example, the food we, uh, we take um, and uh, yeah, the uptake of ingredients and nutrients from the food and other substances. But this does not necessarily mean that the substances accumulate in the body and it starts yeah, with a mechanism of intake and uh, followed by the mechanism of um, yeah, biotransformation and metabolism and finally the elimination from the body. And as, as I said, it's a completely normal biological process. Um, and it's also the case for DIMP. Um, yes, from a scientific point of view, I think there are no indications, or I'm sure that there are no indications that DIMP accumulate in body and nature. Yeah. There is a huge uh, program uh, in the European Union um, to measure the amount of um, substances in, in human. Uh, this is so-called human biomonitoring uh, program. And yes, we see that DINP and 
a lot of other chemical substances are uh, or can be measured in, in blood or urine at very, very low doses. Um, that, that's just a fact um, that we uh, cannot and will not deny. But on the other hand, um, when you compare the level of DNP as an example that can be found in blood or urine, uh, co when we compare this with what uh, the European Union defines as safe levels, we are far below. And so this human biomonitoring bio -monitoring program is for us a good thing because, because it shows that um, although plasticizers are used in huge volumes in daily products like um, um, gardening, gardening uh, tools or in, in, in the wall covering or in medical applications or you name it. Although that the IMP is being used and plasticizers are being used and can be measured and found, there is no risk about it. And this is also something that uh, we should always take into account in the discussion. Yeah, I think a great stipulation and, and background there on that. Um, Hendrik, I believe you have number three here, and that is that DINP is prohibited in many applications. I, I like the question. Thanks for this. <laughs> um, and I can just start directly uh, from where I ended. Um, it is not prohibited in, the, in numerous applications. It's just the other way around. So DINP is being used in so many different um, applications, um, although it is being seen critically in the general public and, and in media, and although there is some negative perception about this. Um, if you really look closer it, to it, you just have to accept the fact that DIMP is allowed to be used in all its current applications, starting from, from gardening, from, from uh, you know, we are uh, now speaking to a, to a laptop and um, you outside, uh, you are listening um, maybe via your iPhone or your computer to this podcast and within those electronical products, there are some PVC products um, containing phthalates and the IMP. Um, I just know about one application where there is a prohibition and that is the um, the application in toys or childcare products that can be put into the mouse. So it's not allowed to be to use more than 0.1% of DINP in such a product. And that's also the reason why we as Evonik do not offer DINP um, to our customers for such an application. But in all the other uh, applications, DINP can be safely be used um, even with direct customer exposure, automotive, construction, indoor, outdoor, architecture, gardening, agriculture, sport equipment, and so on. Just think about the flooring in your gym uh, or in, in your local hospital, or just think about when last time you were in a stadium and you have seen this nice PVC roofing um, above your favorite soccer team, a uh, cable for electronic devices in your home office. So it is clearly a myth that DIMP is prohibited in many applications, and it also should not be prohibited based on the uh, scientific evidence that we have. Awesome. Yeah, I think a great a great response to that question and a great background on on that. Um, question number four, or myth number four, is uh, is a good one, and that is that DINP is carcinogenic. And I think this is the first time we'll also potentially discuss uh, California's Prop 65, which should certainly be discussed, and I think we'll come up here. Um, but yeah, so question number four, and I believe this one's for Nadine, is that DINP is carcinogenic. Yes, uh, as a toxicological expert, I will say something about that. Um, and first of all, I want to clarify that DIMP is not classified as carcinogenic for human health in any country worldwide. And yeah, because plasticizers are so widely used, they have undergone extensive evaluations um, and uh, testings uh, have been performed. And yeah, amongst others, plasticizers are most widely researched chemical substances of all. So there's a huge amount of scientific data 
and also assessing the risk of DINP. And uh, this is definitely good. We and the regulators know a lot about DINP and the data also covers the testing for carcinogenicity endpoints uh, in animal studies. And this is a standard approach in toxicology in general to test uh, for several toxicological endpoints in animal studies. Um, yeah, and again, DIMP is uh, thoroughly studied and rated by numerous scientific panels uh, not to pose a risk or a hazard uh, to human health. But however, as you mentioned, Ben, it's true that DIMP was uh, listed under California Proposition 65 uh, with a claim known to cause cancer in rodents. But uh, yeah, this might be a bit confusing that a substance is assessed to be non-hazardous and being not carcinogenic. And at the same time, there's the claim and the listing uh, under California proposition uh, cause cancer in rodents. And yeah, this listing is due to the fact that uh, there's reported carcinogenicity uh, in animal studies with rodents. So that is true. Um, but these kind of effects that are reported are not relevant for the human. And uh, yeah, I, I do not want to play down the risk, uh, but rather elucidate uh, also the background of yeah, scientific assessments and evaluations. And uh, effects in animals are not all relevant for human. This is well known that there are species differences which play a crucial role in the interpretation of data. Uh, we have to keep in mind that a rat is not 100% equally uh, identically equal to a human and yeah there are also predefined and scientifically justified criteria to be applied to assess the relevance uh, of effects that were reported in animals and to assess it for the human carcinogenicity interpretation and yes, in, in our assessments, we focused on weight of evidence assessments. That means that we look not only an, at one study, but uh, on many and to check the quality of the study and very important to elucidate mode of actions uh, of toxicological and adverse effects. And uh, here, this is the case uh, for the carcinogenicity and it was, um, evaluated and assessed that uh, the effects in the animal studies were not relevant or are not relevant uh, for human. And uh, yeah, also other independent toxicological experts uh, of regulatory authorities uh, came to the consensus of no carcinogenic effects of DAMP to human health. So it's also confirmed by authorities. Um, yeah, it's, it's important to understand that there are yeah, scientific or that there's no scientific uh, evidence for hazard classification uh, for DAMP, also not for carcinogenicity that is relevant for human. Um, so I can refuse the, the claim that DAMP is carcinogenic for human health. It is for, for rodents, but not for human. Yeah, I think a, a great update on that, a great overview on that, both on the, in general, as a potential carcinogenic product, but also what that Prop 65 testing is based off of. So I think some great info in there. Um, question or myth number five, and I believe this one goes back to Hendrick, is that DINP should be substituted as soon as possible. No, it should not. <laughs> Just to be very clear at this point. But it's interesting why, why you come to this uh, to this question maybe you are referring to the so-called sin list the substitute it now list uh, from the uh, ngo camsec um so this sin list has been made of uh, by this private organization to give gui guidance to other organizations or companies or even the regulator on substances that could have a regulatory risk and CAMSEC also offers placing alternatives in their so-called uh, CAMSEC marketplace. But however, uh, I think that also the SIN list as such uh, can be criticized. It creates a kind of parallel system of substance classification or risk evaluation. Um, and sometimes 
ignoring or not taking into account all these studies and the regulatory decisions that have been made in the past. Um, just an example, in the year 2018, there was a huge uh, assessment uh, triggered by the Danish uh, um, authority on um, re-evaluating uh, the uh, classification of DINP according to uh, uh, reproductive toxic properties. Um, and yeah, I also uh, was part of the discussion and um, at the end, the European Risk Assessment Committee um, of the European Chemical Agency decided by consensus, and this was quite new, decided by consensus that although there has been this uh, classification do dossier, there should not be any classification to, uh, to DIMP as toxic to reproductions. Um, unfortunately, uh, yeah, on the other hand, this, this is a good signal and a very positive signal to, to the uh, DIMP industry. Unfortunately, DIMP is still on the so-called SIN list, the substituted now list. But um, based on the uh, assessments and uh, decision by the European Risk Assessment Committee, and based on all the um, scientific information and weight of evidence information that uh, we see, um, DIMP is safe in all its current applications. So there should not be a substitution of DIMP as soon as possible. There's, uh, from a scientific and toxicological perspective, no need to do this. Perfect. Great, great overview and, and answer to that, that myth. Um, our sixth and our final myth on this list, uh, and this goes back to Nadine to finish it off, is that DINP is an endocrine disruptor. Yeah, you have an uh, interesting myth about DIMP and also endocrine disruptors are definitely a current topic of global discussions. And yeah, since I'm located and work in Europe, I know that endocrine disruption is also part of the chemical strategy of sustainability in Europe. And yeah, to allow everybody to understand what endocrine disruption is, I give you some explanation. And an endocrine disruptor refers to a exogenous substance or a chemical compound um, yeah, that can interfere with the hormonal system of mammals or environmental organisms. They disrupt the natural hormonal signaling pathways in form of causing adverse health effects and can influence growth and development processes in an intact organism. And yeah, examples for endocrine disruptors um, include, for example, synthetically produced pharmaceuticals. Uh, we all know the contraceptive pill, but yeah, potential endocrine disruptors may also include man-made chemicals. And now coming back to, to DINP, um, there are extensive evaluations by regulators and authorities in the last years that concluded that at all no hazards were identified with DINP and that means for now based on the available data there's also no evidence that DINP adversely affects the endocrine system um, but yes there are indeed some discussions of endocrine effects and plasticizers but uh, here again, uh, we have to clearly differentiate between the low molecular weight phthalates, which are toxic for reproduction and also known to be endocrine disruptor for human health and environment. And on the other hand, the high molecular weight phthalates, including DAMP, are not showing these kind of effects. And uh, yes, I, I may repeat myself, but it's uh, important to understand that DIMP is not classified for any hazard. And it was uh, yeah, scientifically assessed and agreed to not classify DIMP for reproductive toxicity due to a lack of adverse uh, reproductive effects, as Hendrik mentioned also. And this is uh, a good 
reason why DIMP is likely not an endocrine disruptor affecting male and female reproductive system. So there's no concern for disruption of the endocrine system given with DIMP. And yeah, but uh, as it is a global and current topic, we will definitely monitor all the ongoing discussions and the criteria and new approaches of assessing endocrine disruption and yeah, consider it also in our risk assessments. Fantastic. I think a, a great answer to that specific myth um, and six great, great answers as well. I think we had six common things, common myths that are out in the industry. And I think six extremely strong answers to, to all of them and really debunking all six myths. Um, I think before we wrap up episode number two, are there any final questions or thoughts or, you know, general things that you wish you could tell every, uh, every news outlet and, and agency out there on on some of these myths that are floating around on DINP how would you how would you summarize this episode i think we were all having different discussions on different endpoints parameters like endocrine disrupting properties carcinogenic properties and so on or others to come in the future uh why i'm still feeling very safe uh, uh to work in this industry and also to promote the use of pesticides like DINP is that hey, we have tons of data. We have even a uh, scientific uh, uh, approach to evaluate the quality of studies. And if we all combine this together, the result is um, what we also see uh, by, the, by the regulator, like the IMP is not classified, the IMP is not prohibited, prohibited beside the uh, uh, the one application in toys and childcare product that can be put into mouth. Um, this is all based of based upon tons of data that we have put together, that other players have put together, and the IMP have been challenged over time so often, multiple times. And at the end, if you really look into the data, you can really be sure that there's no issue with the IMP. Yeah, great, a great summary. I think the fact that all this is driven by data and, and has these continuous proven studies and facts is is a, a great piece of information and, and certainly reassuring to these statements on DINP and the, the safety of DINP and debunking some of these myths. Well, I think that's a great summary and, and wrap up to episode number two. I think there's a lot of great content that was in here, a lot of obviously myths that have been floating around on DINP and phthalates. So I think with, with that, we'll leave it here. Uh, obviously, we have episode three of our three-part mini-series coming up, and that will feature more some of the media claims that are out there, some kind of general statements that are out there, some common things that I know Sanjay, I'm sure, hears from customers, and, and we hear from customers and, and end users on some of these th uh, myths and, and claims that are out there regarding DINP. Um, so looking forward to episode number three. Um, obviously, no matter where you're streaming this episode, whether you're watching us on the video version or streaming the audio version, feel free to scroll down. We'll have a link both to episode one, if you hadn't streamed it already, as well as episode three that's coming up here next, um, as well as potentially some additional content. I'm sure there's uh, studies and information published by Ivonic that we'll be happy to share as well. So some, some additional data shared in the links below. So um, with that, Hendrik, Nadine, Sanjay, thank you for your time. Looking forward to wrapping up and, and going over to episode number three so uh again if you haven't streamed episode one please do that otherwise we look forward to catching you in episode number three thank you for streaming the view from jamestown podcast edition like and subscribe for more